Good morning. We're glad to see you here with us at Santa Barbara Community Church. Please stand. Let's sing together. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm back here on the keyboard, if you can see me. Um, we just sang the words, you are the God who always sees us. Earlier this year, we heard the story of Hagar. 
in Genesis, and that she gave the first name to God given by a person, and she gave the name El Roy, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And another version says, I have seen him who looks after me. Family, today you are seen. Listen to the words from David in Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. And it goes on to say, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as a day, for darkness is as light with you. And then skipping a little bit more, it says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days formed for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So let's take a moment to just take some full deep breaths this morning and silently rest and just bask in this good news that we are personally and intimately known and seen by the God of the universe. Father, thank you for taking gentle care of us. If we feel surrounded by darkness, we read that the darkness is like light to you. We are not ever out of your sight or invisible from you. Your word says that you know what we need before we even ask. You say to look at the birds and the flowers and that if you take care of them, how much more do you look after us? Let the beauty of the earth today be a daily reminder for your immense and deep love for us. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. As we grow as your children, let us walk in the freedom that comes with knowing who our Father is and that we are known by him. In your son's name, amen. Let's continue in worship.
Good morning, church. Welcome. Man, what a beautiful morning that we get to worship together. Um, before I jump into our little timeshare um, or time of sharing here, I want to dismiss the fifth through eighth graders. So fifth through eighth graders, fifth, sixth graders, you guys know where to go. Follow Josh. Junior hires, follow Mandy through the breezeway. High schoolers, go ahead and head down to the front lawn. And then if you have been patiently waiting for some shade that has been occupied by these students, feel free to fill in. Um, don't be shy if you see someone who looks like they work here and you need some shade or some chairs, come ask for help. Um, all right, Dave, go ahead and come on up. I get the privilege of talking to our good friend Dave Peterson this morning. Dave, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, share about your role. Yeah, hey, my name is Dave Peterson. I am the area director for Young Life here in Santa Barbara. Yes. A couple, couple people. Yeah. So good. Yeah, some of you are already doing it. If you um, know about Young Life, are involved in their ministry in any way, either as a student or former volunteer, do you want to just raise your hand? Yes. A few people out there. All right. Just a few. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And um, well, our church has had the privilege of supporting and partnering with Young Life for decades. Um, and it's truly amazing the effect that Young Life has had on our community. Um, and Dave is up here to share just a little bit of a ministry update. Um, so yeah, Dave, why don't you tell us what you've been up to? Thanks. If you don't know what Young Life is, the best way to understand it is this. We're a mission organization, and we see our high school and junior high campuses as a mission field. And so we build teams of caring adults who go and they move into the neighborhood and show up on high school campuses doing things with high schoolers to build friendships with them uh, and when the time is right to share the gospel with them uh, in the hopes that they would start following Jesus and grow in their faith. Uh, so that's what we do. And so this past year, uh, because we build teams around our schools, we didn't really have schools. Um, there were just kids at houses and apparently they attended a school, but they were really just at their house. Uh, and so... Did I get lost? There we go. I stood up here um, about a year ago and kind of said, I don't know uh, what we're going to do uh, because uh, there weren't schools. It's kind of a real paradigm shift for us. And, and so we decided um, that we would do our best to be faithful with what we did have. And what we did have is we had a team of volunteers. And so we decided we're going to be we're going to be really intentional about investing in these young people uh, who are college age, 20-something, to help them grow in their faith. We do know some students. Uh, we know some students who we have relationships with. And even though a lot of what we do is try to meet new students on campus, uh, we said we're going to do more one-on-ones and more small group ministry. And then we had a number of folks who had graduated or were college age and were supposed to go away to school but couldn't um, or were on campus at Westmont or at UCSB and a lot of the student activities that would normally be available weren't. And so we kind of opened up a new college ministry. And that's what we did. And I just get to stand up here a year later and say, we're, we're blown away by what God has done. Um, so in a normal year, when we're kind of recruiting new folks, um, investing in leaders, we usually rec recruit and train about 15 new leaders per year. And, um, and this last year, we, we placed 21 leaders onto new teams. Um, and on a normal year, we take 150-ish kids to summer camp and last year, we took 80. Uh, we didn't know until March that we were going to even go to summer camp. And on a normal year with 150, typically somewhere around 30 kids out of that group say yes to Jesus for the first time. We took 80 this past year, and 27 of them said they wanted to follow Jesus for the first time. And so... Yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't... Sorry, I did not mean to breeze over that. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, and then we got to do one other really fun part of this past year, I think just because we had the space to be aware. One of our friends uh, from kind of a low-income situation, first-generation college student, college applicant, uh, we helped him kind of walk through the process, and he won a full-ride scholarship to Westmont, um, and which was kind of a huge part of our story this year. And he's up there now. He's living in Page. Um, and so I'm pretty sure he hasn't slept in a while. Um, but I'm excited for him uh, to be there. And so... I get to stand up here and not to say, hey, look, we did it. Look how faithful we are. But our story is really one of what happens when we try to be faithful. It's really God's faithfulness that takes over. Um, and God blew us away. 
he had bigger plans for us than we could have ever imagined. And I think it's just such a sweet reminder for me and hopefully for the church family here that God is on mission in front of us. He goes in front of us and he cares about our community way more than we do. He cares about the kids in our community way more than we do. And he has a plan for them. And we have the opportunity to just step in faith and try to be sensitive to where he's moving. And so I don't know where you're at or where your ministry is, but my hope for you is this, that you would just try to be sensitive and say, Lord, where are you moving? What are you doing? Um, so I want to say that. And I also just want to say thank you. Santa Barbara Community Church is our church home, my wife and I. Um, and so we, we sit here on Sundays and we love it. Our kids are in children's ministry. They love it. Um, Y'all have been supporting Young Life long before I was here, which has been seven years now. Um, and I, we get to stand on the shoulders of support. So many folks in this church um, have either been Young Life leaders or on committee or are current donors or do a lot for us. And so we're really, really thankful for this community. So I really wanted to say thank you this morning as well. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so it's so good to hear highlights from this past season. Um, can you kind of share a glimpse with us going forward, what you guys are looking at? Yeah, as we looked forward in July, we, we kind of said, like, hey, we're going to plan a full year of kind of being back to normal. And so that's not happening. It's a little different. Um, but we are, we are doing this. We're going to continue with some of our emphasis on college and small groups. It was a gift from last year um, that I think came to us. And we're going to say we're going to keep going with that. Um, and then as much as we can, uh, we're going to kind of move back into some of our regular spaces. So we've had leaders on campuses already now that kids are back at school, coaching sports, helping with yearbook, uh, just being a volunteer at the school. And so we have leaders meeting new kids. Leaders are at sporting events, football games, volleyball games. Uh, so we're excited about that. And then we're going to kind of lean back into some of our larger group events um, in outdoor settings as much as we can. We want to we want to encourage kids to, to be in community and hear about Jesus, and also we want to be good neighbors. So that's kind of where we're headed um, this, this school year. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. And lastly, how can we be praying for you? Yeah, I would say there's kind of three things. So if you if you think about it, so there was a class of kids who graduated two years ago who we kind of lost the last four months of their school year. And then the group of kids who graduated last year, we lost kind of a year and a half with them. And a big part of our ministry is we build these mission communities at the campus uh, where we really encourage high school students who are older to invest in students that are younger. Because when you're a freshman and a senior talks to you and is nice to you, you can think only one thing is like, God must be real. <laughs> and so uh, what we've, what's happened is, is we've lost some of that kind of handing down of student leadership. And so we're praying really hard. We have kids that we know who are in with us who are juniors this year. Um, and they're excited. And so, but what we need is we need some vision. And I think vision really comes from the Lord. And we'll speak into that. But that they would have a vision, even though no one was able to do it for them when they were freshmen and sophomores, that they would have a vision of now that I'm a junior, I can care for freshmen now. And then, and then as I'm a senior, my life matters. Like there is no such thing as a junior varsity year. There's no such thing as a junior varsity Holy Spirit. Like my life today matters and what I do with it matters. And it can matter a whole lot for people who are younger than me. And so we're praying for those friends. Uh, so that'd be the first thing, kind of uh, student leadership. The second thing, uh, we're really thankful that we've kind of continued in financial health over the past year. We've, it's been kind of crazy that God's met us and provided for us, but it feels like we're looking at another year of maybe people feeling uneasy about um, the financial situation. There's just a lot of things in the news and things that people can be nervous, and so we're just praying for continued financial health. And then the last thing is we're, we want to do more, and so we're praying for more leaders to come on mission with us so we can reach more kids. So three things, student leadership, continued financial health, um, and then more folks to be on mission with us and kind of our leader level. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Church, let's show Dave and Young Life our appreciation, our Thanks, gratitude. Dave. And with that, I am going to lead us in a time of corporate prayer. So I'm going to give words to our prayer, um, but you all get to join with me. Um, so why don't you assume a posture of prayer, um, and I'm going to pray for us as we start this morning. God, we praise you this morning. We thank you for who you are, that you put on flesh and dwelt among us, that you entered the mess and brokenness of a fallen world and took away the consequences of our sin 
so that we can enjoy covenant relationship with you forever. We're so grateful for your unconditional love. God, we're grateful for sunny, warm days. We're grateful for a beautiful place to live. We're grateful for friends and family. Would we fix our eyes on you this morning? God, it has been so good to be reminded of what it means to be your church these past few weeks in our anniversary series. And thank you truly for blessing us with a church family um, where we can worship you for entrusting to us the work of ministry, for giving us the task of being salt and light in a city on a hill. Would we steward that responsibility well, Lord? And as we enter into this season of the fall, whatever it holds for each of us, would we go to our places of work, our schools, our neighborhoods, our areas of influence, bearing your image and building your kingdom. Thank you for Dave and the volunteers who work with Young Life, um, for everyone who is involved in that ministry, carrying the good news of abundant life with you, Jesus. Thank you that they are up for the task of spreading the gospel to students. Um, and God, we just thank you for the gift to partner alongside them and pray that you would continue to strengthen and sustain them. We pray for those three things that Dave mentioned this morning. Would you continue to provide financial health for them? Thank you that you have um, blessed them with that this past year. And we pray for student leadership, for those intergenerational relationships that point to you and your goodness and your surprising upside down kingdom. And God, we pray for more. Um, thank you that you have given Dave and his team a heart for more lives saved and more um, ministry. Would you equip them for that and bring, bring them to the places where you are already at work? God, this morning we acknowledge that you are seated on the throne and we want your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And yesterday marked the 20 year anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and God, we mourn for the lives lost on that day. We pray for families who are still grieving and missing loved ones. Lord, we bring before you a world still very much marred by violence and struggle. Grant the leaders of our country discernment and wisdom as they navigate the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan. Provide protection for those on the front lines in our military, both for their physical bodies and for their minds. Give all parties hearts for mercy through the power of your Holy Spirit. Above all, God, we pray for peace. And with the gubernatorial recall election happening here in California on Tuesday, God, would you care for us as your people and as we exercise our responsibilities as voters, would we not put our hope in chariots or horses or politicians or parties, but in you, our one Lord and Savior. God, all of this um, just reminds us that we are still longing for heaven for the day when you will have made all things new. And in that vein, we lift up those in our congregation this morning who are hurting, mourning, and in need of the healing, redeeming presence of your Holy Spirit. God, we specifically lift up um, Tom and Maddie Hardiman and their family as they continue to grieve the loss of their son-in-law, Cameron. Draw close to them and be with them. And God, lastly, we ask that you would bless Mike as he comes up to teach. Would you give us soft hearts to respond to your word? And would you, with the words of his mouth and the meditations of his heart, be pleasing to you? Would our worship of you this morning be glorifying in your sight? Amen. Good day, everyone. Uh, I have a few announcements before we get into the Bible today. Um, here are my announcements. Um, couple. Well, first be, things first. Um, God is glorified when his people reflect his character. We know that God is a generous God, and that's why we take uh, special offerings twice a year like we did at the end of August. Um, we take a special offering for the poor. And I just want to report that we were able to raise together $62,000, which is going to go to World Relief in Sudan to help the poorest of the poor. 
I just want to say, well done. Let's keep continually uh, trying to shine the light of Christ into this world. And so thank you for your generosity in that. Let's keep being generous. A um, couple things on the agenda in the next weeks ahead. Next Sunday, we're going to have a what we call foundations gathering. This is for people who are new to our church, want to hear more. Some people who have been around a while and want to hear what it means to take another step into uh, belonging to this church family. Um, so next Sunday, after the 11 o'clock service, if you're interested in being a part of that, if you would contact Deanna, um, you'll probably see her. Out. She's sitting under the tent over there on the way out, um, or you can just email her, Deanna at SB Community. We'll have lunch for you, and uh, there's a few things that we'd like you to watch in advance to coming, so that's next Sunday. Um, also, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated a baptism right out in the center here. It was awesome, and we're going to do that again because we have a conviction that it's important to be obedient to God, and he said that he has, he, uh, when we place our faith in Christ, it's important to witness that before the world by, by uh publicly identifying with him. So if you haven't been baptized since placing your faith in Christ, November 7th, we're going to do that again, and we'd love to give you some more info or just give you, answer some questions you might have about that so you can contact us. Lastly, this weekend, I'm super excited to be going to the Santa Barbara Sending Conference. Charlie's over there on a table. He's been organizing this and would love to talk with you more about that on the way out. Um, that's this coming weekend up at Westmont. This is uh, a little conference about the, the big mission of God. I can't wait to be there. I hope some of you will be there with me. So with that in mind and all said and done, we get to jump into Isaiah this morning. Are you excited? Woo! All right. That's what I wanted to hear. Well, um, my job this morning is to set the table a little bit for this uh, the next 10 weeks that we're going to be studying Isaiah together in our home groups and teaching um, through this book on Sunday, and I realize that um, some of you have read it many times, and then others of you uh, may have very little experience or knowledge of what's in the book of Isaiah. So I thought, where do you begin? <laughs> and a task like I have today, providing some basic orientation, my mind went to John Wooden. You know John Wooden? He was the famous Hall of Fame basketball coach for UCLA who who, you know, won 10 or 12 championships in the 60s and 70s. You know what he did on the first practice every year? And, like, he was winning championships every year, but every year he would come back. The first thing he did on the first practice was get all his guys together, and they wouldn't talk about defense or passing or dribbling or shooting. He would teach them the right way to put on their socks. That's right. He said, if you don't know how to put on your socks the right way, you're going to get blisters, and then you're no help at all to our team. And so let's figure out how to put on our socks the right way. He started at the very beginning. So I'm going to do that together today with Isaiah. What's the very beginning? Where is it found? If you grab your Bible and split it almost in half exactly, you might wind up, not like I did, in Isaiah. But if you wind up in the Psalms or the Proverbs, maybe Ecclesiastes or Song of, Song of Solomon, you have to keep going to the right. If you wind up somewhere where there's somebody else's name, like Jeremiah or Ezekiel, you've gone too far. But you're going to find Isaiah because, well, two things about Isaiah. One, um, it's long. <laughs> 66 chapters. If we were to start reading it through aloud right now, it'd probably take us about three and a half hours to get through it. Now, if, if you you're like like the shorter kind of books of the Bible, you can take another prophet like Obadiah and get through it in three minutes. Uh, but Isaiah is long. It's also very old. The book we're holding in front of us is ancient. It's older than the leftovers at the back of your fridge. It's older than that faded picture of your grandma that you treasure. It's older than the castles of Europe or the Great Wall in China. It's older than those 2,000-year-old redwood trees that you hiked beneath this summer. Uh, this book relates to us events that happened 25 to 2,700 years ago. It's been treasured for centuries by Jews and then later on eventually by Christians as well. But partly because of its age, Isaiah can be difficult to know what to do with. 
Don't ask me how, but uh, not too long ago, a couple months ago, I, I stumbled across this little video. Uh, uh, it was a clip from the Ellen DeGeneres show. Now, I've never watched one of her shows in total, but this episode, she had one of her young viewers come up to the front. And it was like a college-age gal, and she had this table on which were some ancient artifacts from the 1980s. <laughs> And she asked this gal to identify what these artifacts were and then to see if she knew how to use them. And so there were things like the yellow pages. She said, do you know what this is? And the gal said, well, I think it's phone book, right? She said, well, yeah. Uh, do you know how to use it? She said, well, we had one of those growing up in our house, and, and we used it like sh my mom would put it on the chair to boost me up. <laughs> so, well, that's not exactly what it's for. I mean, you can use it for that. But she had this uh, challenge in which she had to look up like a muffler shop or something. And it was, it was hard for her because she'd never used the yellow pages before. And the other ancient relics like a boom box. <laughs> and she said, do you know what this is? She said, well, it's a CD player. I said, no, this is back before CDs. <laughs> and she had her try to figure out how to dial in a radio station. And, oh, you got to pull up the antenna and turn it on and all this stuff. And, and then there was the best was the rotary phone. <laughs> Watching a young person try to figure out how to do a rotary phone was like, no. It's, anyway, you got to actually pick up the receiver first. Okay. Anyway, what does it have to do with Isaiah? Well, Isaiah, again, we may know what it is. It's, well, it's a book in the Bible. Uh, it's God's word. But we may be a little bit more challenged in knowing how to uh, what to do with it. Isaiah can be confusing. It can be challenging at times. There are names of people that are hard to pronounce. There are places that we've never heard of before. There, uh, once we start reading through Isaiah, we quickly discover that it is not like Genesis that we read this summer. It's not a story with a beginning and a neat end that goes chronologically. Uh, we, we realize that neither is it like the book that we studied last fall, 1 Corinthians, it's a personal correspondence. Rather, Isaiah is a completely different genre that we're going to learn about. If you were at uh, Sandy Richter's seminar this weekend, which was just awesome, um, she, she mentioned that, that we should understand Isaiah is an anthology of his sermons. Now, if you have an anthology of the Beatles music, it's like their greatest hits, right? This is Isaiah's greatest hits of his preaching over about 50 years of being a prophet. This collection has been meticulously edited and arranged, not chronologically again, but thematically in order to, to present a message to us. So despite the challenges the, the, that we might come across in the next several weeks of reading and studying Isaiah, I got to admit, I am so excited to dig into this uh, prophetic book with you. And I hope in the next several minutes that uh, to orient you a little bit to the landscape of Isaiah so that we don't feel as lost in the coming weeks that we're going to be there. And, and more than that, I want to provide you with some excitement and motivation of w why we should be uh, excited and eager to dig into this book together. So, uh, most of the time, we begin a sermon. The preacher will come up here and say, turn to so-and-so, and we open it up. We read the text, and the preacher will say, this is the word of the Lord, and you respond, thanks be to God as a recognition that this is a treasure, this is a gift to God's people, and then we'll unpack it together. But since my task is to give an overview, we're not going to read three and a half hours worth of text. I'm going to keep giving us a little context, and then by the end, we're going to hear from the prophet himself. So um, I would like you to turn to the very beginning of Isaiah and just look at the very first verse with me as we seek to get the lay of the land. So Isaiah begins like this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay, how does this help us get our bearings? What do we know of this prophet, Isaiah, the son of Amos, other than that his dad's name is Amos? Um, well, we think that uh, Isaiah was most likely born in, to a noble family. He has access to the royal courts and to the kings um, that would give us that idea. 
We know his, his home was in the capital city of Jerusalem. And we know as we read, we get to see that Isaiah's role as a prophet was not like a nine to five job that he just checked in and out of at the end of the day. Rather, it encompassed the whole of his life. It caused him, even in his family life, to do some rather unusual things. You can imagine when, when uh, Isaiah's wife gave birth to their first son, she probably said, what do you think about the name Abraham or Jacob? To which Isaiah said, oh, I was thinking more about Sheer Jashub. <laughs> what? He saw the, the birth of his child as an opportunity to give a, a prophetic signal to the people that, that those who would go into exile, a remnant would return, which is what the child's name meant. Rather unusual. Well, think about it when it came to the second child. She was probably really hoping for a more traditional name, but that child was given the name Meher Shalal Hashbaz. <laughs> That's a mouthful, is it not? Uh, even if it was a nickname. His name means something like speed to the spoil, haste to the booty. This was, again, a signal that he used the, the birth of his child as an opportunity to give uh, a message to the people about an impending military invasion. Not only did it impact his family life, well, it, it became very uncomfortable from Isaiah. Nobody asks to be a prophet um, for reasons like this. In uh, Isaiah 20, which we're not going to study in our home groups or preach about on Sunday, but if you read Isaiah 20, you'll, you'll read that at one point, God wants Isaiah to let the people know, a people of Judah, where he lives, that the, the people of Egypt in whom they're trusting for security and protection are themselves going to be taken naked as prisoners of war off to Assyria. And so God commands Isaiah to walk around naked in his hometown for parts of three years. I mean, that's a story, wouldn't you agree, that is not often in children's Bibles? <laughs> it just kind of gets skipped over. Uh, it's a job that required courage. It's a job that required speaking truth to those who often did not want but desperately needed to hear the truth. Now, the other thing that, that uh, this very first verse gives us is not just a little clue to who's going to be doing the prophetic work, but, but the timetable. You'll see that it's, he prophesied during the king's uh, reign of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, and most of us will go, huh? When is that? Well, let me give you a brief timeline, give you some like, key dates in history. Um, this summer, we studied Genesis and a, a very rough, clean date, 2000 BC is when Abraham lived. If we kind of fast forward quickly through the centuries, we would go from, from Isaac and Jacob and Joseph to Moses and Joshua to the time of the, the, the judges, to Samson and Samuel. And by the end of that period at 1000 AD, uh, BC, we've reached the time of King David. If you fast forward through another 250, 300 years later, that is the days of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah and the, when the ministry of Isaiah took place, roughly 740 to 690 B.C. And most of what we read about in the first section of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, relates to two monumental national uh, cr moments of crisis in the nation's history. 734 B.C. Uh, was when uh, Judah's two northern neighbors engaged them and, and tried to, had a plot to assassinate their king and put in their own puppet king. And that was a moment of crisis that they had to deal with. Fast forward another 30 years or so, 701 B.C., the northern tribe of Israel has been obliterated and the massive, mighty armies of Assyria are now surrounding the, the capital of Jerusalem. And their very existence as a nation is, is called into question. And it's at these key times in the nation's history that a lot of the action in Isaiah is taking place. Now, again, it's hard for us because we don't know all the names and places and, and what all went because of our gap in history. But I just want you to imagine this, again, yesterday was the 20-year marker of the 9-11 attacks. I want you to imagine if Jesus doesn't come back 
for another 500 or 1,000 years, how historians will look at our day, and particularly that day and time. People who study this time will have to become familiar with odd names like Osama bin Laden and George W. Bush. They'll ha have to figure out what were the twin towers, what was going on, and how did that affect the ethos and the spirit of the age? What was at stake and what was going on? Our world has been profoundly shaped by those events, and their world was profoundly shaped by what was going on there. And it's into that world that Isaiah, the prophet, brings the word of God. And um, we're going to have to do a little work. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves this fall and, and try to figure out, do some digging uh, to understand the context in which this all is written. And it's only when we understand what it meant to them that it's going to be uh, meaningful uh, we'll be able to appreciate what it has to say to us. To that extent, if you missed our uh, Isaiah seminar that Sandy Richter put on this weekend, Friday and Saturday, you missed it. Oh, you should have been there. It was awesome. Have no fear. She's on video. And, and I would strongly encourage you, it's going to help this text come to life if you watch her lectures on the background of Isaiah, how to understand it. It will enliven your experience of our, of our study together. So are you ready to dig in a little bit this fall? Uh, it's going to be good. Um, now, let me switch gears a little bit and move on from kind of historical context and ask the question I know is on a lot of people's minds, why should we bother studying this, this ancient text over the next several weeks? What possible relevance could it have to our lives who live in the 21st century? It's a good question, and if there's a good answer to it. And I want to be, if not a little simplistic, uh, tell you what I think is the most important reason. My biggest need in life and your biggest need in life is to know God. It's to know God. Not philosophies about God or theories, theologies about the abstract higher beings, but to know the living God. And we live in a day when thinking about God has become extremely muddled. Christian Smith, uh, a sociologist at the University of North Carolina, in 2005, he, he conducted uh, with a team of researchers a study on the faith of American teenagers. And after collecting all their, their research and interviews and so forth, um, they compiled their results and they, they deemed the, the faith of these American teenagers at the turn of the century, uh, with this label, they called it moralistic therapeutic deism. Perhaps you've heard of that. Let me say that again. They believed in moralistic therapeutic deism. In their words, this is a faith in a particular kind of God, one who exists, who create, created the world, defines the general moral order, uh, but is something like a combination divine butler and cosmic therapist. And so this God, uh, well, he's always on call. He takes care of problems when they arise most of the time. Professionally, he's, he's at work to help people feel better about themselves and does not come too personally involved uh, in the process. Now, some of you might say, oh, that's just a study of American teenagers. Teenagers are always off on weird things. They'll come back to it. Well, before we blame teenagers, uh, Kenda Creasy Dean is another academic at Princeton Seminary. She wrote a book in 2010 building on that same research. Her book was called Almost Christian, What the Faith of Our Teenagers is Telling the American Church. And she observed this, and I think she's right on. She said, the problem does not seem to be that the churches are teaching young people badly, but that we are doing an exceedingly good job of teaching the youth what we really believe. Namely, that Christianity is not that big of a deal, that God requires little of us, and that the church is, an, is a helpful social institution filled with nice people. Look around, aren't these people nice? And Isaiah comes at that moralistic, therapeutic deism with a sledgehammer. He will have nothing of it. And it's this kind of, of vague, anemic God of our, our day and age that he eviscerates. 
And Isaiah instead, in its place, gives us a laser-sharp vision of a personal and powerful God who will brook no rivals and bear no substitutes. What we're going to see in Isaiah is, is a God who hates sin, but a God who is able to save sinners. A God who rips through the veneer of our niceness and demands our complete allegiance and trust because he knows what's best for us. As we read through the book of Isaiah this fall, we're going to get to know this God better. We're going to get to see that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We're going to read about a God who is Israel's king and redeemer. He is the Lord Almighty, who says, I am the first, I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. This God does not suggest or plead. He commands, saying, stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. This God sees through pious hypocrisy. We read, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, and yet their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely on human rules that have been taught by men. Therefore, church, because we're getting to know this God in Isaiah, we are going to uh, not be surprised, hopefully, that one of the key themes that we're going to see, especially in the opening chapters, is that of judgment. We're going to read about it again and again. Why? It's not because our God enjoys punishing people but rather because God sees what is the inevitable result of sin. Let me explain. About a month ago, I was uh, driving up to church for a staff meeting, and on my way I decided, I'm I'm a good Christian guy, I'm going to listen to my Bible. So I got up my my phone, uh, got my Bible app open, and turned it on so it was reading to me on my way to church, and I almost got up here. I was all the way on the 154 between State and uh, Foothill off-ramp when I realized I hadn't really been listening that well. And so I looked down at my phone just to press pause. And in that moment that I looked down, the SUV in front of me stepped on its brake, and I went right into it. Yeah, I know. You you can give me a little more sympathy than that, you know. (laughs) And uh, let's just say that the, the SUV did not sustain much damage, but I felt so bad. I mean, we, we pulled over on the side of the road, and I'm just apologizing profusely. It was totally my fault. I was stupid. I should not have been looking at my phone. I'm so sorry. And her kids got out, and they were all glassy-eyed. They were going to the first day of school. And they were. Fi- I know, I felt like such a heel. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we exchanged information and so forth. But then w- she drove away. And uh, I looked at my car. My hood was completely tacoed. The uh, radiator was pushed in. It's smoking everywhere. And, and I, I look at my 1998 Honda Accord, and I realize very quickly that it would take much more uh, to fix this car than it, it is worth. And so I had to figure out where to tow it. So, of course, I towed it to the only place you can tow it, to the car recycling center down over by the dump. And... Uh, whole time there, I'm thinking, I hope they give me at least something for it. And you know, when I got there, they insulted me with $100 for my car. This is a perfectly good engine, you know, four new tires on it that are great. And probably somebody's going to come in and pay 100 bucks just for the door handle or something. But anyway, um, I was not too happy. Needless to say, why am I telling you this story? Well, Isaiah's uh, message often includes warnings of judgment because God sees what is coming when his people behave foolishly. He sees that the only possible result of our waywardness, our our lack of trust in him, can be nothing other than a total loss, just like my car. And so he warns us again and again, we're going to hear words of impending judgment. Don't go there. This is where this is heading. And especially this week, as we're going to be studying chapter 5 in our home groups. This is why the message is going to be dark. 
And when we get to chapters 13 to 27, a lot of messages of judgment, not just for Judah, but of all the nations, because sin has consequences, and God hates sin, and he loves us, and he wants what is best for us. So there's a lot of judgment in this book. But let me go back to my car story for a minute. I got home, and I called the insurance company, because I, I wanted to tell them that I was no longer going to be paying them monthly to insure my steel pancake of a car that was down at the dump. And so, you know, that was no longer going to be my car, and I gave them information, and I thought that was that when I hung up the phone. The next day, I get a call from the insurance agent that said, our estimators have been thinking, and, and after taking out $500 as j- from your deductible and some other charges, uh, we're going to give you three thousand dollars for your car and i laughed i was like do do you know this is mike wilbanks you're talking to about my 1998 honda there's no way it's worth that much that's what they said they'd give you and i I, i'm just standing in my office cheering i told lara that night and she said can you crash the rest of our old junky cars and (laughs) my story was a story of uh surprising hope And what we read in in the book of Isaiah is not only news of judgment, impending judgment, but it is a story of surprising, outrageous hope and restoration, not only for the people of God, but for the whole cosmos. We're going to read verses like this in Isaiah, spoken to a sinful people. Come now, God says, let us reason together says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Wow. Surprising hope. We're going to read to those who say, the Lord has forgotten me. The Lord has forsaken me. God says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on, on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Oh, this is good news. What we read in Isaiah, this surprising hope that the Lord will swallow up death forever. Chapter 25, the sovereign Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken in that day. They will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him. He saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. There's lots of great news in the prophet of Isaiah. And that's good for us because I don't know if you're like me, but I hope so. We are people who are hungry for hope and longing for a solid place to put our feet. And our lives, too, are filled with many insecurities and challenges. And regardless of what your struggles or challenges are, Isaiah's voice rings out to you this morning. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his his ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Is that good? This is the message of Isaiah. And God has proved himself faithful to this again and again throughout the generations. But let me story, tell you a little story about somebody who, who heard this message and found God faithful. It's about a, a young boy named Charles. He was 15 years old, wandering the streets of, of London on a very unusual day. They were having kind of a snow apocalypse there, a very freak snowstorm. And, and this boy Charles was looking for a place to go to church, and the place he had in mind As the snowstorm kicked up, he realized, I'm never going to get there. So he ducked down a little side street, and he noticed a sign that says Primitive Methodist Church. And he just said, i got to get out of the snow. So he goes in there, and there's a little church. There's only about 12 to 15 people there that day. Most of the congregation had probably been snowed in, including the pastor himself, who had not showed up that day. But on they went with their worship service. And since the pastor was not there, somebody else needed to step in and preach. And it was a poor man who he thought was probably a, a tailor or a shoemaker or something like that. And he got up and he chose a text from his sermon that was from the book of Isaiah. And he read this text to the people. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Thus says the Lord, 
in the old King James. He read, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Well, the preacher, being somewhat unprepared and a novice at this, had to stick pretty closely to his text because he just didn't have much to say other than what the text said. So he kept telling the people, look unto me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. You don't have to be that smart to just look. You don't even have to lift a finger. Just look unto the Lord and be saved. Then he started riffing, look unto me. See me sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me hanging on a cross. Look unto me. I was dead and buried. Look unto me. I look unto me. I ascend and I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. Look unto Jesus Christ and be saved. After spinning this for about 10 minutes, he had completely exhausted himself of his material. And so he looked around at his little congregation and in a group of 12 to 15 people, visitors are pretty easily distinguished who they are. And so he sees this 15-year-old boy, and he points at him, and he says, young man, you look miserable. Much later, he said, well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to having remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit before. <laughs> However, it was a good blow struck. And he continued, you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey this moment, you will be saved. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. End of sermon. Now I want to ask you a question. Did the preacher know that Isaiah was preached, or was penned hundreds of years before Jesus was even born? Was this preacher cheating? Was he just a novice and didn't understand that this is a, a, a book far before the time of Christ? How could it refer to Jesus? Well, I want to suggest that whatever he knew or didn't knew, this novice preacher was in very good company. For when we get to the New Testament, John himself writes in his gospel that he quotes from the book of Isaiah twice, and then says, Isaiah saw the glory of Christ and spoke about him. Isaiah spoke of the glory of Jesus hundreds of years before he penned, before the birth of Christ. This is why Isaiah is often known for good reason as the fifth gospel. While as we read our New Testament, there are just dozens and dozens of references to Isaiah and how it points again and again to Jesus, the Son of God. And I want to remind us today, us who may be worried about the state of our nation or our society, again, that our hope is not in Gavin Newsom or Larry Elder or any other person like this, but our hope is in the one Isaiah writes about when he says, For uh, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. Isaiah was pointing us to Jesus. For those of us who are concerned about the cause of justice in our world, Isaiah cries out, Here is my servant. This is the voice of God whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry aloud or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. But in faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. Isaiah was pointing us to hope in the one to come in Jesus himself. For those here today who are torn by, by grief, sorrows of any kind, who are overwhelmed by your own sin and think as you look at yourself, my life, I've made a total mess of it. It's a total loss, like Mike's car. Isaiah points us to the, the, the anointed one of God. And he says, surely, 
He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, friends, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Are you ready to get into Isaiah this this fall? We're going to have to do some work, but Isaiah is going to show us glimpses of, of the, the, the mighty Savior sent by God for us, the servant of God, the branch and the root of David. And we're going to see him in fresh and living color together this fall. And I want to pray for us to that end. So Lord, as we begin on this journey through Isaiah, Lord, will you meet us? Don't let us get discouraged when we get confused about what we see, Lord. But help us as a community, as we read and study and ponder these words together, help us to hear your voice. Help us to see the hope of the gospel on every page. Lord, let us be attuned to your warnings for us. And God, let us be a people who are even more eager and desirous of putting our whole trust and devotion in you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Isaiah does communicate the gospel to us. And we get to see a great picture of the gospel week by week as we take the Lord's Supper. I want to tell you something before we take this. We often pass out these elements on the way in. And uh, it, it can just be maybe a thing you think, well, we're just everybody's doing it. But this meal uh, is only for some people this morning. And if it's not you, we're still glad you're here. We, we pray that you'd continue to come and watch. But this meal is for people who know that on their, if, if you live life on your own wisdom, your own strength, your life will become a total loss. But it's for those who can say uh, with Paul that I consider everything a surpassing loss according, uh, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That, this meal is for us. For those who, who have seen Jesus and recognize that, that God treated him as if he had made a total wreck of his life even though he had lived perfectly for us. So if you know that, I want to invite you to take this meal and remember with me the cross of Christ. On the night before he went to the cross, he had a meal with his friends, and he gave these elements deep and mean, uh, just profound significance. He took the bread, and he, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So friends, let's remember the body of Christ broken for us. In like manner after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new agreement in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Take and drink. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our worship. There's going to be a prayer team over here. If you would like someone to pray with you and for you about anything, something we've talked about today or just some uh, challenge in your life, Feel free to go have him pray for you. But the rest of us, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing songs of praise to our great God and Savior.
consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God is Son, not spared, sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul lift our voices up then sings my soul then sings my soul
to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen, amen. go in peace